Ladies and gentlemen, to today's tutorial, today we want to continue our journey with the organs of the pituitary gut. Today, we want to look at the small intestine, of which the layman will call it the small bowel. Remember that the small intestine will be relevant in the chemical digestion of various food substances. Apart from that, it's going to be very relevant when it comes to absorption of the end products of the chemical digestion. Remember that there is a very long, you know, structure actually beginning from, you know, the gastroduodenal junction to the ileocecal, you know, junction. Now remember that it's going to be a long tubular structure. Yes, roughly about six meters. Yes, it could be more than this six meters. And anatomically, we are going to divide it into the first part, second part, and fourth, the third part. The first part being mostly retroperitoneal. We are going to look at that. That is the duodenum. You know, and of course, continue our genome and ileum will be, I mean, actually mobile because they are intraperitoneal, you know, connected to the posterior abdominal wall by way of mesentery proper. You know, we're going to see that one. Now, remember that, yes, this organ that we are talking about, yes, will be a very remarkable organ. Yes, even when you look at the duodenum, sorry, if you look at, I mean, the genome and ileum, you will see some differences, although there's no sharp boundary between them. We also look at the I mean the duodenum. Yes, we're going to see the various parts. It's going to have four parts. You know, for the first part, second part, of course, you know, the fourth part. So without yes, much ado, one thing that we have to know about these things is that the duodenum, yes, I mean clinically, you wouldn't call it to be, you know, include it as part of organs of the small intestine. Because as I said, it's mostly fixed and therefore it's not mobile. But the remaining duodenum and ileum are mobile. So that's one thing. The other thing is that, yes, developmentally, the duodenum is coming from the foregut as well as the midgut. For the duodenum and ileum, they are exclusively coming from the midgut. Therefore, the blood supply will be mainly by the superior mesenteric you know, vessels. But for the, I mean, duodenum, it will be getting some supply from, I mean, I mean, superior mesenteric vessels, as well as, of course, you know, branches from the celiac trunk, which often we will reserve it for that of, you know, the foregut organs. So without much ado, let's go through the journey of, you know, the small intestine. So, here we are. This is a small intestine. Where, of course, we saw that at the level of the pyloric spinster. So that marks, you know, the end of the stomach. And this junction is the gastroduodenal junction. Now, as you come here, you meet the first part of, you know, the organs of the small intestine. The first part being the duodenum, all the way up to this point. Then, of course, you get to the jejunum and the ileum. So, we want to take them through pretty soon. Now, the duodenum is just about 25, you know, centimeters long. You know, actually, just about 25 centimeters long. And I said that just the first yeah, 2.5 centimeters portion of it is actually intraperitoneal. Because, of course, we know that the stomach is intraperitoneal because of its close proximity with it. It is also, you know, intraperitoneal. Now, the remaining portion, the entire portion of, you know, the first part, as well as the second part, throughout the third and, of course, the fourth part, will be actually, I mean, retroperitoneal. I mean, they are found behind, you know, the peritoneum and therefore they are not mobile so making it you know fist now you realize that the first part is devoid of you know there is nothing in there it appears smooth its lumen appears smooth okay because i mean its lumen appears smooth it is lacking these things that you are going to find with the rest now you can see that the rest of them will have these transversely running you know fools which you call them circular fools known as i mean valves of Kekrin, or we can also refer to them as plaque, you know, circularis. Remember that the plaque circular, we are going to see it, yes, you know, with the exception of the first part of the duodenum, we are going to see it throughout the entire duodenum, the entire duodenum, as well as, you know, the plasma part of the ileum. We are going to find, you know, this plaque circularis. This, these plaque circularis, what they are going to do is to, I mean, to increase the absorptive surface area. Remember that the small intestine is a very long structure. In it, that that long structure is going to help in increasing absorptive surface area. Apart from that, 
increasing the absorptive surface area by a factor of three will be by these clicky circularis. But remember that the first part of the duodenum is devoid of you know plaquey circularis. Remember that we said that the pyloric you know spinster will be at the level of L1 vertebral level. Therefore, the first part of the duodenum is related to the L1 vertebral level. That's the L1 level. Now remember that on radiographs, if you take a barium meal and let's say they suspect, you know, I mean, duodenal ulcer, then what happens is that in here, when they take a radiograph, it will appear as cap. You know, this area on radiograph, the first part we refer to it as the duodenal cap. Duodenal cap. Now remember that yes, it will be connected to the liver. Okay, it will be connected to the liver by way of a ligament, which we call it, you know, gastroduodenal ligament. Now the free mind of this gastrointestinal, uh, I mean, ligament, which is part of the lesser omentum, will contain the portal triad, portal triad, namely, you know, the hepatic portal vein, you know, hepatic artery, and of course, you know, the common bile duct, common bile duct. So that is what we are going to find, you know, over here. Now, again, what we have to also see is that, of course, because this is more closer. To, of course the stomach it is going to be the area where you are going to see you know these gastric you know I mean sorry duodenal you know ulcers duodenal ulcers of actually part of this peptic ulcer that we are talking about now this portion is actually very small okay very small compared to I mean some part of it okay compared for us the second part which we are going to see but with respect to relation now this one Actually, roughly will be about five centimeters long. The first part will roughly be about five centimeters long. Now, with, in terms of relations, what we find is that, yes, I mean, anteriorly, okay, anterior part of it will be related to this one, which we call it, I mean, the quadrate lobe of the liver, together with, of course, you know, the gallbladder. So, the gallbladder, together with the quadrate lobe of the liver, will relate to the first part of the duodenum, you know, anteriorly. For the posterior relations, okay, behind it, for the posterior relations, it will be related to, you know, actually the, I mean, the uh, bile duct, actually the common bile duct, as, as well as, of course, the inferior vena cava, you know, they will relate to it, you know, of course, I mean, posterior, the common bile duct, as well as, of course, the inferior, you know, vena cava. Now, superiorly, it will be related to the natural opening where you want to enter the lesser sac which is found behind the stomach and that is the epiploic foramen of Winslow. So the epiploic foramen of Winslow will relate to it and this time around it will be a superior you know, relation to it. But of course inferiorly it will also be related to of course the head of the pancreas. Below it it will be related to the head of of course the pancreas. Now, it comes all the way from the L1 level, actually around the L1 level, and then it gives a 10. And this 10 is known as the superior duodenal fleshier. Now, the 10 over here that you find, as it becomes the second part, this is the first part, the 10 over here is known as superior duodenal fleshier. And this, so it marks the beginning point of the second part of the duodenum. And therefore, the skin part of the duodenum, because it goes this way, we call it the descending part of the duodenum. The descending part of the duodenum. Now, importantly, the descending part of the duodenum is related to actually the head of the pancreas. Okay? And the pancreas will be coming with this, I mean, main pancreatic duct, which is known as duct of Wesson as well as, of course, the minor pancreatic duct. Now, remember that the major pancreatic duct okay and the i mean minor sorry the common bile duct that is coming from the i mean common bile duct will meet okay at the ampulla of beta and open into the second part of the duodenum so it's actually the skin part of the duodenum that's the secretions from the bowel or bowel secretions as well as you know for pancreatic secretions will get into the duodenum okay sorry we'll get into the second part of the, duodenum. the second part which is related to this one and of course, I mean, that's the hepatopancreatic, of, uh, hepatopancreatic ampulla or the ampulla of beta. And this ampulla of beta will be guarded by a sphincter of OD. Remember that all these ducts will be guarded by their own respective sphincters. There will be sphincter for the major, 
yes, Pankade, that there will be spinster for my uh, for the common baldax, and there will be spinster for the ampulla where they are meeting. Okay, garden they opening into the second part of the odinum. Now, when they open into the odinum, gives an, some kind of elevation over here, mucosal elevation, and that is what we call major duodenal papilla. Now, if you look at this way superiorly, we have the accessory pancreatic duct, which will open independently of the major pancreatic duct. And therefore, we also have, you know, minor duodenal, you know, papilla, minor duodenal papilla. So that is one thing that, you know, internally you are going to find with the, I mean, I mean, first part of the duodenum. And it gives this kind of C-shaped, you know, area, external, where the head of the pancreas, you know, actually fits. Actually fits. So that is what we find with the descending part of the duodenum. It will also span all the way from L1 level up to L3, you know, vertebral level. And this one is a bit longer than the first part, the superior part, being around 7.5, you know, centimeters long. 17 centimeters long. Now, one thing that we find is that this one will be related anteriorly to what we call the right lobe of the liver. The right lobe of the liver will relate to the second part anteriorly in the living. You will find that it will relate to it anteriorly. Apart from that, of course, you know, of the transverse colon will also, you know, relate to it anteriorly in the living. Of course, this is a model, so we won't be able to see it very clearly. So it will relate to it anteriorly. Again, apart from this, we also have, you know, uh, so regard the posterior relations, it will be related to actually the right, you know, kidney, right kidney, right anterior surface of the kidney will relate to actually the second part of, you know, the duodenum. And of course, laterally, by what we call, you know, the, I mean, the flesher, which we call it the splenic, I mean, sorry, it will be the hepatic flesher or the right you know, colic flesher will relate to it anteriorly once again. We are going to see that one there. Then, of course, you know, medially, as we've already seen, will be related to the head of the pancreas. Okay, will be related to the head of the pancreas. Yes, even apart from that, even the bowel duct, as well as, of course, these pancreatic ducts that we have seen, so related to it medially. So, that is importantly one thing that we have to learn about the second part of the duodenum. And that is why most of these chemical digestions that are going to take place in the duodenum will be carried out by the chyme Sorry, I mean, will be carried out by the small intestine. You know, the small intestine will perform mainly some chemical digestion. Mainly, it's going to be by the chyme of the second part of the duodenum. Because secretions from the bowel, which is going to help emulsify the fat, then, of course, pancreatic secretions, which is rich in enzyme under the influence of, of course, secretin, you know, I mean, and of course, police is kind of to bring the bowel into the second part will be relevant, of course, in fats, you know, of course, protein, of course, and of, as well as, you know, carbohydrates digestion will be happening over here. All right. So when you look at this, I mean, the pancreas, we explain those enzymes, as well as, of course, the sucrose and tericus, you know, the, I mean, I mean, enzyme which will be coming from the brush border. Okay, of you know the small intestine, actually the duodenum will be helping in this regard. So mainly the chemical digestion of food, which we said is going to take place in the small intestine, will be taking place in the duodenum. Now, so that is one thing. Now the next part, which of course over here, the in the descending parts of the duodenum will curve again at what you call inferior duodenal flesh inferior duodenal pressure okay from the level of l3 because this one began from l1 to l3 the descending portion and then transverse to run transversely or the horizontal part okay where is the third part will begin from the level of l actually three will be at the level of l3 so that's what we are going to find now at this place now the third part is roughly about 10 centimeters long it's actually yes i mean the longest actually yes it's about 10 centimeters long Yes, as we said, it will be at the level of L3. And it will move, you know, this way. It will move to actually the left part. Okay. And actually cross, you know, to, I mean, cross over what we call the inferior vena cava because the inferior vena will be the peritoneal organs as well as, you know, the abdominal aorta will cross them actually anteriorly. But with this one, the relations will be that anteriorly it will be related to actually the right lobe of the liver. Sorry, I mean anteriorly to be related to what's course, you know, the superior mesenteric artery, superior mesenteric artery, which we look at those arteries, you know, in our subsequent sections. 
and all of course, of course, superior mesentery being will also be related to it, as well as root of mesentery. Now, what happens is that the small intestine, okay, mainly the jejunum and the ileum, will be connected to posterior abdominal wall by a double fold of peritoneum, known as mesentery proper. So they will be related to it, you know, in that regard as well, anteriorly. Now, for the posterior relations, it will be related, yes, to the actually the right, I mean, part of the swass, you know, major muscle will be related to it. Of course, you know, the right ureter. Then, of course, you know, the right gonadal vessels, which, of course, we can see it here. We will do look at it in our later sections. Yes, together with, of course, you know, the abdominal ureter that we made mention of already. But what we find is that inferiorly, okay, sorry, superiorly, superiorly, the, I mean, the horizontal part will be related to the head of, you know, the pancreas, as well as, of course, you know, the oncinate process, oncinate process that we find over here. Which some people will call it oncus, that's the oncinate process, will be related to the, I mean, the pancreas superiorly. Then, of course, even apart from this, I mean, I mean, I mean, superiorly, we're going to see, you know, the cause of the small intestine also relating to it. I mean, in the living, we are going to find all these things there. So, in our later sections, I will go through the blood vessels for you to know, I mean, all these blood vessels that we are talking about. Now, but one thing that we find is that yes, there's the longest part that we've seen over here at this point, which we call it the gastroduodenal flesh. Okay, it will move all the way. So we have this portion, the fourth part, will be moving from L3 actually to L2. So it will move superior. So this will be the superior part. Sorry, the ascendant is moving up. So there's the ascendant part. Of the duodenum, of the duodenum. This is actually is about just 2.5 centimeters, you know, long, and I mean it will be actually related to what we call the transverse, you know, colon, actually anteriorly, together with its mesocolon. So you see that one, okay? We we'll look at all those ones. So this is the transverse colon, which will be here with its mesocolon, we we'll relate to it actually anteriorly. Then, of course, you know, apart from this. We will also looking at the posterior relations being the left roots of the diaphragm, because more related to the left part. Of course, apart from this, you know, we will also look at, I mean, the left, you know, swass major muscle. We also look at, of course, you know, the left renal vessels, as well as, you know, inferior mesenteric vein. You know, they will actually relate to the, of course, you know, together with the left, you know, another vessel. So we look at those, I mean, blood vessels. I will look at that one and explain. Now, one thing that we find with this fourth part is that this area, okay, the fourth part moves superiorly and joins the ileum. There's that kind of sharp, I mean, boundary that we can find between the duodenum and the jejunum, actually the jejunum. And that is what we call the flesh that is created here, which is called a duodenum jejunal flesh. Duodenum jejunal flesh. Now, this duodenum jejunal flesh will be connected to the right cruise of the diaphragm by way of a ligament which we call it the ligament of I mean trees or some people will call it I mean the suspensory muscle or ligament of trees so that is that one now this muscle will consist of you know some skeletal muscle in its upper one third part you know its middle one third will be elastic fibers and of course you know the lower third will be smooth muscles will be smooth muscles so that is what we are going to find with you know the duodenum. So that is what we find the duodenum. The duodenum, if you pierce someone's abdomen with you know a sharp object, the portion which will come out will be the duodenum and ileum. The duodenum will not come out because it is fist, mostly fist. Now this mobile portion of the small intestine is the duodenum ileum, duodenum and ileum, ileum part. Now one thing that we find is that because we said that. The duodenum will be developing from both the foregut and, of course, the midgut. It will be having, you know, blood supply from all these two areas. And then, importantly, we are going to find, you know, blood vessels like gastroduodenal artery, which is a branch, you know, actually of common hepatic artery, which is also a branch of the celiac trunk, which is a blood vessel of, you know, actually the foregut. Again, it will be getting its blood supply from actually, you know, the superior and inferior pancreatic duodenal arteries which are branches of superior mesenteric artery, which is a blood vessel 
of actually the maker. So we we'll look at all those. I'll explain those blood vessels in our subscribe sections. But remember that they will be drained, you know, actually into what we call the hepatic portal vein, you know, by the corresponding veins, eventually draining into the hepatic portal vein. So that is one thing that we are going to find with the duodenum. Now, so this is a small intestine. This is a small intestine. Uh, actually, the jejunum and ileum. Now, we saw that there was a sharp boundary between the duodenum and the, I mean, the first portion being the jejunum. Now, the distal portion is actually the, I mean, ileum, which will terminate, okay, in, I mean, at the ileocecal junction, okay, around here. So we are going to look at that one. Now, one thing is that there is no sharp boundary between the ileum and the jejunum. There is no sharp boundary between the ileum as well as, of course, you know, the jejunum. Therefore, there are certain things that can help us to actually know, you know, the differences. And it will be by way of looking at the thickness of these areas. We look at, you know, the vascular supply in the living. So let's look at this one. So now, if you look at this, you realize that. So look at this. Now we have these mucosal fluids. These are the valves of Kerkrens. Now remember that apart from these valves of Kerkrens, we also have villi, finger-like projection, which are microscopic. You may not be able to see it here. Then apart from this, we also even have what we call microvilli under electron microscopy or striated border, which are going to help increase you know absorptive surface area by factors of you know 10 and 20 respectively remember that plaque circularis which are these ones are going to increase absorptive surface area by a factor of three so in all if you have a small intestine being endowed with plaque circularis being endowed with this long length being endowed with actually villi as well as microvilli then it's going to have a total or a net absorptive increased surface area to actually 600 i mean 200 times you know, sorry, I mean, it's going to be 600 times. So because it's going to be 3 by, you know, 10 being 30, actually multiply by 20. So it's going to be, yes, that kind of 600 times increase in absorptive surface area. So that is one thing that we are going to find. Now, what I'm going to show you is for us to know the differences between, now remember that we said that the small is going to be about something like, I mean, Roughly six meters. Okay, this whole length is quite very long. I mean, structure that we find here, which is about six. I mean, meters. Now, or six hundred centimeters. Now, what we find is that there's that kind of continuous. I mean, relation that we are going to find between, of course, the jejunum and the ileum. But we can use some kind of I mean, differences. Now, the jejunum consists of about you know two-fifths of the entire length of the jejunum ileum and therefore roughly it will be around 2.5 meters the ileum you know constituting majority being actually you know three-fifths roughly you know 3.5 meters now what we find is that yes um in situ you know in the living in situ we are going to find you know the i mean the uh, actually the jejunum mostly being in the I mean, upper, uh, you know, left quadrant, actually, with the ileum, most of it being the right lower quadrant. You know, that's what usually we are going to find. But one thing is that when you look at the wall, when you look at the wall, what happens is that the jejunum is thicker, okay? It's quite thicker compared to that of, you know, the, the ileum. The ileum is less thick compared to that of, you know, the jejunum. So that's one thing that we are going to find. Now, I've intentionally removed the mesentery proper so that we can see actually the full length of the structure. Apart from this, we are also going to find that the lumen of the jejunum will be wider, okay, or will be greater than that we find for the for the ileum, for the ileum. So that is one thing that we find, okay. So, for instance, this area. Is more likely going to be the ileum. Okay, it's less thick, but the jejunum is quite thicker. So that's one thing that we can see. Now, apart from this, we're also going to find that 
the blood vessels in the living of that of the jejunum. The genome will have what we call longer basal recta. There will be some larger. Remember that from superior mesenteric, you know, actually, you know, I mean, there will be jejunal branches as well as ileal branches, which will further divide in the mesentery to give rise to what we call basal recta, straight vessels, which will enter to supply, you know, the jejunum and ileum. Now, these straight vessels, for that we find in the ileum, they are, I mean, longer compared to that we find for the ileum. Okay. Now, the next thing is that we also have what we call, I mean, arterial arches. Arterial arches. You know, they also give some arches, some arches. Now, what happens is that for jejunum, we have less arches, okay? But as we move the saline, then the arches tend to increase. So, ileum will have more arches, which are also blood vessels, compared to that of jejunum. So, in the living, what we find is that the jejunum will be redder compared to that of the ileum. In the living, you are going to find this kind of, I mean, differences. Now, again, if you look at this, if you look at our valves of Kettering's, you realize that for jejunum, it's having quite prominent, larger ones, prominent ones, okay, and they are more numerous compared to that of ileum. Now, ileum, this area, okay, is having less, you know, prominent ones, okay. Now, it said that this portion of the ileum will be devoid of you know plaquey circularis you know that's what we are finding here but these ones you can see that they are less numerous and they are i mean thinner or they are fewer and thinner comparatively now in the living the mesentery for actually the ileum will be having you know i mean more fat for for jejunum it will be having more fat compared to that of the ileum so there will be more fat for the mesentery of the jejunum compared to that of the Ileum. So that's another thing that we can see about these ones. So, I mean, one thing that is, I mean, striking for us to you know is that, I mean, of course, we've seen that there's that kind of sharp boundary between that of the duodenum and jejunum, but there's no sharp boundary. So these are the things which are going to actually help us to help in this regard. Now, we look at the large intestine, we look at some similarities and, of course, differences that we can look at, you know. Now, one thing is that the small intestine is having simple columnar epithelial tissues with goblet cells, numerous goblet cells. Now, as you descend the stalid, the number of goblet cells will be increasing. So, comparatively, if you look at the duodenum, as you descend, okay, to right to the terminal portion of the ileum, then the goblet cells will be increasing. Now, these things that we've mentioned, the flaky circularis, yes, the villi, the microvilli, are going to help in absorption, you know, absorption, okay. And these, I mean, Things we we'll have to get into what we call the hepatic portal vein, okay, to, to the liver for various processes for various detoxification, but we we'll go through actually the corresponding you know veins, you know superior mesentery veins, all the way you know ileal veins, jejunal veins, draining into what we call superior mesentery veins to be sent into the hepatic you know portal you know vein. That's one thing that we have to you know understand here. So mainly for absorption and it's quite mobile. If someone pierces you with, you know, I mean, a sharp object in the abdomen region, because most of the abdomen will be occupied by these kind of small intestine. After all, it's very long, but it is actually convoluted, you know, in the living to ensure that this six, I mean, centimeter long remarkable structure, I mean, remarkable structure is, you know, actually fitting in the, you know, abdomen, in the abdomen. So one thing that we can also say is that generally the diameter okay, of the lumen will be actually decreasing as you move from the duodenum right to the jejunum. So that's one thing. So duodenum will have relatively larger diameter. As you come to jejunum, it will be smaller compared to that of the, I mean, the duodenum than of course to that of, you know, ileum as we have seen. Now, so mainly that is one thing that we've learned today. So in our later section, we will look at that of, you know, the large intestine to get, I mean, a complete picture of, you know, the small and large intestines. Thank you very much and may God richly bless you.